Hello and welcome to Eastdrop and Get the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And we're talking about Witness for the Prosecution today. Yes. 1957 film directed by Billy Wilder. Starring Tyrone Power, Charles Lawton, uh, Marlena Dietrich. Mm. Adapted from Agatha Christie's stage play of the same name, which I think was adapted from her own novel, short novel, um. of the same name, from 1925 or so. Mm. And from what I understand, this is one of the few adaptations of her work that she liked. Oh. I think this and the 1974 Murder on the Orient Express. Mm. You wanted to watch this because we'd recently seen... And then there were none. And then there were none, which neither of us was that impressed with. Yeah. But that's another the Claire film. Uh, and we've seen lots of Agatha Christie adaptations. And in fact, we've podcast about, you know, well... Um, we podcasted about the two Murder on the Orient Expresses that we saw. Yes. And then what was the film that was like a, an Agatha Christie adaptation? Killer, the knife one with... <laughs> Knives Out. Knives Out. Yeah, that was the um, Ryan Johnson yeah. one, which I think is going to get... It's, it's, well, it's got a sequel. It's, they just released a trailer, I think. I've not seen it. But, yes. Um, and there's it's, also it um, Death on the Niles coming out, right? And I've just come back from London, and in fact, Witness for the Prosecution is playing again. Um, I think I saw it with Nicky at the Old Bailey. Which is uh, where it's set. Which is where it's set. You know, it was, it was a marvellous experience, actually, to have the whole film played out in that scene and I think you know it's now reopened in some other courtroom right um, but you know it's, it's being done in a courtroom so I mean Agatha Christie's fascinating because she her work keeps on living and getting readapted and mm. you know and actually it's it's work that I mean I devoured it as a child but you know, it has no depth or, or none that I can detect anyway. <laughs> you know, no, uh, it's almost it's kind of pulpy. Well, it, it's got beautiful construction and the characterization works because she doesn't offer any. It's almost they're almost all types mm. that she works with. Right. Uh, so they're instantly recognizable, but in a very superficial way. Yeah, well, um, there's that whole thing about, like, the butler did it. It's, like, where that comes from. So, uh, Mike, we haven't gotten to the plot yet. What's the film about? Charles Lawton is this lawyer who had a heart attack. He's in bad way. He's been told not to go to court for criminal trials anymore. But he's approached by this guy played by Tyrone Power, who is going to be approached by the police and is going to be arrested on suspicion of murdering this old lady that he got to know. And all of this information comes out about money that he was in her will for, about his wife, and this whole thing about him relying on his wife's, uh, who's played by Marlene Dietrich, his wife's testimony, because they're married. And then, actually, it turns out they're not married, and she can be a witness mm. for the prosecution. So, has he murdered this woman? What's happened? Is mm. he going to get off? What's her role in this? Mm. That's what the film's about. And did he do it? Yeah, I said that. Oh. <laughs> 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 All right. So uh, anyway, this is a film that offers a lot to think about because, I mean, you were telling this joke about... Yeah, you tell it. <laughs> it wasn't a joke. It was an anecdote um, that Alfred Hitchcock told Billy Wilder that people kept on coming up to him and saying, oh, I love Witness for the Prosecution, thinking it was a Hitchcock film. And Billy Wilder said, oh, people keep coming up to me and saying, I love the parody case, the Hitchcock film. And I was thinking, like, it's interesting that... It's interesting the idea of suspense and mystery. Right, because this is a mystery ultimately, and that's what Christie is for the most part. Mm. It's about what you don't know and what you find out at the end. That's right. And Hitchcock is the master of the suspense. Yes. Right, and actually, it's funny that on the poster for this, the original release poster, which is on Wikipedia, it says once in fifty years suspense like this. Right. I would not call this suspense, right? Because suspense is about what you know that characters don't. Yes. And how you know? So I think I think Hitchcock explained it himself as. Suspense is about having a bomb under a train seat and yeah. knowing that it's there and waiting for it to go off. The suspense is in knowing that it's there. If you don't know that it's there, that's not suspense, right? Yeah, but they're not necessarily contradictory. And I think what you often find in Hitchcock is both mystery and suspense. Well, the, the thing that they really have in common is control of information. That's what they're all about. Yeah. They're, they're all about the plot and they're all about control of information and who knows what. And who knows at what, what time. when, yeah. Exactly. Who knows what and at what time. And the audience is key in that, right? Because it's like it's 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 control of information flow to the audience, but also between the characters and the things. Mm. So, so the best mysteries and suspenses are incredibly cleverly plotted. Mm. 
And this, I think it's funny what you're saying about Christy kind of living on and her work continues to be adapted because it's work that you would think could be very easily ruined once you know what the end is, right? What's the point in seeing it a second time once you know how, cares. how it all goes? But like, it clearly doesn't matter. Yeah. Although I do think that part of it for me is that I don't know how all these stories end. So that is still a well, good part I mean, of it. The thing is, I've read, I think, I think I've read all the novels and I think I've seen all the films and if not mm. all pretty close to all. And I never, I never remember. Really, so it, it almost it doesn't matter. I you, think that's it as well because at the end of this, there's an announcement in the closing credits from a, a some announcer who says, "Please don't spoil the ending. Let other people know it'll be real, be ruined, and all this kind of stuff." And apparently, I was reading that that Marlene Dietrich felt that this cost her an Oscar because she. I should say spoilers yes. <laughs> for a film from nineteen fifty seven, but still nonetheless spoilers if you've not seen it. She is revealed to have played this Cockney character who I didn't know it was her the first time. Yeah. I thought there was something off about it, but I didn't know it was her. Um, but apparently, like, in the in the Oscar campaigns, they didn't want to bring up the fact that she was, she'd was done this performance because it's part of the twist, mm. or one of the twists. And she kind of felt like, you know, she poured everything, everything into this, and but people weren't to know it was her, you know. Which, you know, it's it, it, kind of a shame for her, because I think she's very good as that. She's very good, and I think Wilder wrote it for her. Yeah. Right. So a lot of what you see of Dietrich really plays well on his personal knowledge of her, but also on her persona. Right. So, you know, in the flashbacks in Germany, the room she's performing in is the blue something or other. Right. So uh, you know, reference a, to the blue angel, a reference to the blue angel. And also it kind of connotes a foreign affair with. Uh, Jean Arthur, you know, that film that Wilder did that is set in post-war Germany. Right. Where, uh, you know, she sings that uh, uh, wonderful song, Wanna Buy Some Illusions. Um, and her costume is a reference to a costume from Morocco, right? The trousers. Yeah. Has to uh, be. Exactly. You know, and being ripped. And she looks fantastic in all of that. And, you know, it's kind of like a great scene, actually. And then there are all those things, I'm German, discipline, you know, all those things that you associate you yeah. know, with, with Dietrich. So it's a marvellous use of her. I just kind of quickly was glancing through Google and, uh, you know, there's an academic article that was arguing, oh, this is not one of the most important Billy Wilder films and it's not one of the most important Dietrich films. But actually, I do think, you know, it's certainly not one of the most important uh, Wilder films Though, you know, I think it was a glossy, big-budget film of the time. Mm. And it was a hit, I think. It got six Oscar nominations as well. Yeah, so, so it has an importance on a certain level. Um, but I think it is an important film in Dietrich's career, actually. She plays a dual role. It, it's constantly referencing her star persona. She gets the twist, and she gets the big scene at the end. Mm. I mean, I was talking earlier how Tyrone Power was the big box office star. Yeah, I mean... They probably got this film made on Billy Wilder and his name, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, Dietrich as a star, yeah, as a film star, certainly didn't have the box office traction that he'd had in the 30s. You know, Charles Lawton either. But, you know, the film is really, to a large extent, about Charles Lawton and Dietrich, mm. in a way. And Tyrone Power is always in the background, out of focus, behind the pillar. <laughs> yeah, he gets a couple of scenes. Yeah, but it's, it's more than a couple. He is important. He is the one on trial, but well, but he's not the focus of your attention. He doesn't yeah. draw the eye. I mean, let, so let me rephrase it. Of course, you know he wouldn't have agreed to do it. You know, had he not been given something to do, but you would have expected him to have gotten a lot more attention and to be more central in a film like this than mm -hmm. Dietrich or or indeed Lawton. You know, so I do think that something happened in the shooting. Well, I was reading that Charles Lawton's part was expanded oh. by Wilder in the adaptation to make him more of a character. So, I mean, you've, you've seen the play. I don't know how well you remember it, but I was reading that it is more focused on the trial than on the murder, yeah. which is not, you know, the, very, the first hour here is given over to Charles, to Lawton. Charles Lawton trying to smoke. Yeah. You know? Uh, and, and he's wonderful. You know, my God, it's like one of those things where he is a ham. There's no question about it. But also he's wonderful. I mean, he does... Well, he gets every laugh. He gets out of laugh, laughs that are not there. He evokes character. You get a sense of a man and his life and his preferences and, you know, his relationship. I mean, he yeah, so it's, it's something that's both uh, hammy and subtle at the same time. I, I, I'm not 
being very articulate about it. There are little moments that he has where you get the sense of... So basically, he's at the start recovering from a heart attack. And this is why he's not allowed to smoke. He shouldn't be taking on murder cases. His mm. doctors have said no more criminal trials. And, you know, he's reluctantly going along with that advice. But gradually, he realises he wants to get involved in this case and so on and so forth. And when it gets into the case, you know, his health problems are still very, very clear. And you really get the feeling in these little moments of, of the, like, this is exhausting him. Like, he, he wants to be there and he likes doing this job and he wants to defend this man. He believes that he's innocent. Mm. But there are these moments he gets where, you know, he takes his medication or something. And it's just this little character moment that's, that lets you know that like, this is exerting pressure on him, exerting a physical toll on him that I really like. Mm. And actually, there are a lot... It, I'd say a lot of, like... A lot of the character stuff comes through bits of business. So with him, it's everything with the cigar at the start. This constant trying to smoke and hide the ashes and go out the window and all this. Mm. The thing about interrogating people with the use of his monocle to reflect light on their faces, you know, mm. which is a little bit more kind of plot relevant because he's really trying to get information out of people. Mm. That's less businessy. But still, there are these, you know, the thing about hiding the cigars in the uh, in the walking yes. stick. It's all just character stuff that enriches his character. It's very interesting because I've always loved Elsa Lanchester or Lancaster, uh, which is uh, his wife, who was his mm. real life wife. And plays his maid in this, maid nurse. Assistant. Yeah, a nurse, really, yeah. attendant. I've always liked her. She's a very appealing and warm and witty actress. But I think she's hammy in this, yeah, in a way that's not compensated, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of overly cutesy as, as a conceptualization and as a performance, actually, both. Whereas, you know, he whom I've always thought of as hammy is both hammy and truthful somehow, yeah? Kind of. Mm. I thought they have very good chemistry, though, which is maybe not to be that unexpected because they're married. They've been acting together for 40 years by this point. <laughs> but, you know, but you can tell, like, the bits that, that, the bits that have been created for them to do together really work. Yeah. I was, I was really fascinated by the film. I think, I think it's the kind of film that you don't see anymore. And it's very instructive. So on the one hand, we're saying all of these uh, Christie adaptations are being done now, but they're not being done like this, you know. And one of the things that fascinates me about this film is how, you know, how much medium long shots there are in the courtroom scenes. So you rarely see the protagonists on their own. And you might get a big reaction shot at mm -hmm. an important moment where you see Teron Power reacting or Marlena Dietrich with a sense of relief. And, you know, that, that'll get a medium close-up, not even a, a huge close-up. You know, but most of the rest of the film is done so that uh, Marlena Dietrich will be on the stand on the left hand side of the, on the left of the frame. And you'll see the judge and the jurors, you know, and the mm. audience, right? Like, it, yeah, it's, it's social. It's always taking place in a world, right? Whereas, you know, you'd see this on TV and it would be this close up, that two shot, that close up, you know. You might get a shot of the jurors at a certain point, but you would never get, I mean, the frame is teeming with people. I think you never have like, yes, between 20 and 100 people in the frame, yeah, mm -hmm. during the courtroom scenes, yeah? Again, with the exception of the odd close up and so on. But yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the average shot would be one, you know. Quite heavily populated. Quite heavily populated, yeah. which I think is very interesting, you know. Anyway, the only reason I remarked on it is because it's so unusual to see that now. Yeah. yeah, it feels like it. Um, it'd be interesting. I mean, it maybe isn't the best example because it was so extraordinary, but I, I'm thinking about Mangrove and mm. paying attention to how many people are there. Um, I'd certainly remarked upon it in the, in the Trial of Chicago 7, to be fair, even though we agree that was not a well-directed film. Mm. But I, I remarked upon the, the scale of the kind of production and yes. the number of people involved that had that. Yes. I mean, and it was important for that story, right? This was a big trial in real life that a lot of people were interested in. You had to show a lot of people there. Yeah, but it's unusual. I mean, you know, and actually I'm not going to be very convincing because I can't remember the titles. Mm. You know, but I see courtroom drama on television all the time. You know, mm. both movies and shows. And it is very close up two shot heavy mm. and I would argue that even in the trial of the Chicago 7 you don't get as many people in the frame as you do here well I mean we, we could do a head count but you know I don't know well, it was also, a full courtroom but maybe not as big as the old baby uh, set but also not as standard so for example you know I think in the Chicago 7 of course you would have establishing shots with lots of people but then you would cut in 
right? And here you also have it. You have an establishment. But when, when you cut in, you're still seeing 50 people. You know, I'm you're just t- seeing them at a, at a clo- you know. I must say, I mean, I would like to actually go back and have a look for that reason because I'm not flat out disagreeing with you. But I, what's certainly true is I never got the sense in Chicago 7 that you were cutting to, you know, a room with five people in it just doing this scene. Sure. You know, it always felt like it had all the number of people, even if I don't know whether you actually did keep on seeing them in the back of, back of frame. I don't know. Well, I mean, um, that, that's something that I but, might toy with. And, you know, just, yeah. I mean, again, you know, I couldn't swear on the Bible because I'm not a Christian. <laughs> 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 so it wouldn't mean anything. But, you know, I mean, I think the only reason why I have remarked on it right now and I commented it to you both viewings mm. is because I find it so unusual. Right? So I think, you know, just trusting my instincts has to be a reason why I find it so unusual. And we just saw the trial of the Chicago 7 last month. Mm. So, so either, you know, my memory is really flaking out more than I think, you know, or actually there is a difference in that here. Yeah, I think definitely the shot selection is different. You don't get the emphasis on close-up in this that you do mm. in more modern mm. things or just other things. I'm not convinced about... The, how well the scenes are populated and how kind of consistent that is. I'm not sure that mm. you're right, with, but there's definitely a, there's definitely a difference in feeling. It, in fact, you could say it's theatrical, right? I, I mean, one thing that I think this film does is very well adapt something theatrical to cinema. It feels cinematic, but part of that, part of the, what's great about it is is the staging and the blocking, the way that people are spaced out within the frame, and the way that the frame you know, is yeah. designed to accommodate them. And play them off each other. It's cinematically theatrical. Yeah. And that's not a contradiction in terms, for sure. It has flourishes of all kinds and so on. So I think that's right. Uh, But I also think there's a different way of staging that is just historical, right? So, you know, Billy Wilder's very good, but I was noticing how at the very beginning, you know, in the chambers, what long takes he was using and how Mm. wonderfully... He was getting people in and out of the frame for the scene. And moving the camera. And moving the camera. But moving the camera in a way that you were not meant to notice, right? Whereas now you'd have a steady cam swirling all over the place, you know, and so on, <laughs> right? Yeah, so, so the film, uh, well, it has a different design. I mean, you are not meant to notice the camera movement. Yet it's, the camera movement is designed so that you don't notice it in this film, mm. you know. Uh, but nonetheless, it's done in very elegant kind of long takes so that rely, you know, to a large extent on the actors, you know, and the actors, you know, hitting their mark and interacting with each other and so on, right? And I think that's also a style of a really highly skilled director of that moment. It's definitely a style of the era. And it's theatrical, you know, it's got the moment of revelation, uh, Marlena Dietrich in her dual role I mean that is a theatrical moment of like revel- you know uh, of revelation it's very theatrical yeah kind of how it's shown to you um, her introduction in the scene set in Germany is very theatrical yeah and it's also knowing slightly cynical bartering sex for money is in the air yeah mm-hmm. all those things that you associate you know with Dietrich sophisticated sexuality and way of being in the world, you know, which has a kind of a pragmatism, really. Well, I think it's, her character's interesting because her, her first introduction is when she appears in uh, the chambers. Yes. Um, to introduce herself and to, to plead with the, the, the barrister to take the case. And, you know, when they start talking to her, she's calm and in control and confident and all this and intelligent and, yeah and then you get back to the flashback where she meets her own power in the in the club and she's playing the accordion and she's you know she's sexy but she's wearing those trousers and that's part of the thing of the scene it's like they want to see your legs you know yeah but then they um, rip off the trousers so you see her leg they do. well this <laughs> is what i'm getting to right so like she's confident and she's con- controlling this room but then she's attacked right mm. and they rip her trousers and expose her leg and you can see how that's kills her confidence, right? It, re- it really kind of screws with her, and you get the sense of how this woman can be hurt, I think. And Well, more than that, I think you get a sense of post-war Germany, you know, I mean, there's been, like, amazing books about that, right, of, like, the Red Soldiers coming in and raping all the women, and, right, yeah. you know, and also the hunger, and, you know, how many women turn to prostitution just to, to mm. feed themselves, right? And actually, the film suggests all of that without quite saying it. But to think about her kind of specifically, like it, it's an evolution of her character from what we've 
been introduced with this confidence, right? There's this vulnerability in her. And throughout, gradually, you get the sense, you know, she loves this man, will do anything for him. And that's a vulnerability. Yeah. Right? But that is really revealed at the end, where you get the whole... The whole German romantic thing coming out, right? Yeah. Everything's about love. And then if you don't love me, I'll kill you. <laughs> like hyper inflated romanticism, right? Yeah. But I think the thing is, like, it's it's not until I really thought about that and how her character is developed over the course of the film that I noticed it. It's actually quite subtle, I thought. Um, it kind of... I, I, maybe it's just because you watch it and go, oh, yeah, that's Marlene Dietrich, that's Marlene Dietrich in 1957, she's doing some acting. And, and then it's only after you go, oh, no, that, there's actually some really subtle modulations in her performance that you yes. realise she's very, who she's playing and how. She's very good, and she's very difficult to talk about because, you know, she's got so many fans, and rightly so. I mean, you know, she looks amazing, you know, she has such an impact with her singing and so on. But I have often found you know, some of her performances very inadequate, you know, and basic things like body posture, line readings. I sometimes used to show people a scene from The Devil is a Woman, which is, she, it was her favorite film of herself. Mm. And I thought, you know, it goes to show what a bad judge because she's got this pouting scene with Don Pasquale, which is just, I think, dreadful. You know, but you could never argue with anybody who's a fan of hers about how bad she is because, you know, they just think she can do no wrong. But I think in this performance, she's very good. Yeah. Um, mind you, you know, she'd been acting by then for 40 years, so she must have learned something. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I always love her as a performer. I think she's a brilliant performer. But if one can distinguish, you know, between being a performer and being an actor, mm. you know, then I think her acting sometimes fell short, yeah? And she needed all the help from von Sternberg and so on that she could get. Though then she also used that very effectively. I mean, I think few actors have used lighting and composition and so on and costuming and better than her. You know, so that's also part of a performance. The thing I was going to say earlier just quickly uh, that I kind of trailed off was um, talking about the announcement at the end that says, yes. you know, don't tell anyone this. Because I saw the mousetrap on stage, which is Christie. It's back in the West End. Is it? <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, just see it again, because this is the thing, right? I saw it a few years ago. I'd I saw it probably, see. saw it probably 15 years ago. And again, at the end, you know, when it's all been revealed and the thing ends, they come on stage and they say, please don't tell anyone. And they'd be doing this for 50, 60 years, however long it's been running. Longest running stage play in the West End, right? Yeah. And the thing is, like, if I wanted to tell you how it ends, I couldn't now, because I have completely forgotten. So it would be great to see it again, because... Part, like I say, part of the thrill is I forget all this stuff. I don't want to know, and 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 the huge part of the thrill of Christie is in the not knowing. Yes. But I do think that a, a secondary thrill, once you do know, is seeing how someone else has done it. Yes. You know how some other stage director, how some other film director has put this together. Because mm. that was the interesting thing about when we saw the two Murder, Murder on the Orient Express. Orient because yeah. you know I thought the, the way in which. The, the material has been adapted differently, and the focus on the character is different. I found really fascinating. Mm. You know, so that's an that's a thrill. We should well. do the same when Death on the Nile comes out. We should do the earlier one, the earlier version as yeah, well. Yeah, that'd be great. And I do love those announcements that say, you know, that make that, that it makes it feel like more of um, it's more of a spectacle, right? You know, yeah, when they say, "Don't tell anyone." Yeah. What uh, wasn't it with Psycho? Psycho yeah. They had what was it in Psycho? Don't tell anyone the end. Uh, and Psycho, they wouldn't let people in. That's right. After the film well, had started. Spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> spoilers for the most famous film ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because in those days, I mean, I remember myself as a teenager, you could just go into the cinema anytime you wa- you wanted, right? Like, mm. so it wasn't like here that I hate the advertisements and I hate, you know, because also having that stupid hour in between films or 45 minutes in between films, it uh, kills off that practice. But, you know, so for example... As a teenager, I would always um, go shopping on a Saturday, right? You know, mm. kind of, you'd, you'd collect your pay or whatever, and then yeah, I'd, I'd go and I'd buy books and whatever, and, you know, and often, like, you know, you'd be tired or something, and you'd just stop off and watch a, a film, right? Because you could sit down, right? And, you know, and it was a movie. And uh, you could go in at any time and watch it as, you know, mm. as often as, if, you know, if it was good and you wanted to see it again, you saw it again. If it wasn't good, you'd get out at the time you came in, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, but actually, there was a wonderful comfort about cinemas. Yeah, that it was a place of rest and and sex and everything, right? But 
it, it wasn't like theater. You didn't have to dress up. You didn't have to go in at a particular time. You know, there was no intermission. You could go whenever you wanted, right? Although the, the, the old woman, Emily French in this, the old lady who's murdered for her money, when she goes to cinema, she's wearing a fancy hat. She is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Know? So you could still get dressed up for it. You could, and people did. And there was different class you could pay for expensive seats or cheaper seats. Mm. Yeah. Though when I was going, it was all the same price. But earlier on, you yeah. could have, there would have been different price points. But I was um, reading as well, similar to Psycho, I did read, they didn't let people into the very end of this. So it wasn't like, you can't come in after the start, but they wouldn't let people see the very end if they hadn't been yeah. in the film already. On the other hand, I remember reading about Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney performing in the Capitol because they went to publicise Babes in Arms, I think it was. And they were so popular that um, people wouldn't leave, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so they were performing like five times a day, right? Like, yeah. you know, and people were so eager to see them live that they just wouldn't leave their seats. So, you know, yeah, you couldn't, the room wouldn't empty, right? So after the second day or something, they had to introduce like really crap comedians for <laughs> half an hour in the hopes that at least some of those people would leave. <laughs> 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 I also want to say that I think this film ends really brilliantly. Yeah, it's got a load of great. It's it's like a it's like well two big twists in the final scene yes. basically. One comes very very hot on the heels of the other, and I didn't see either of them coming. And that is again like part of the big thing is like, how is this all going to shake out? And it's always going to be something in there that you didn't expect. And the clever thing here is that it's been this set up the whole time, and your main character Charles Orton has been taken for a ride himself. And then, it's, you know, I suppose not unlike when I was saying about the um, Kenneth Branagh murder on the Orient Express. It's kind of how it reflects on him and how it affects his view of the world. And what's really nice is that, you know, after he's been taken for a ride by this murderer and convinced, you know, lied to, he has the get up and go to do it all again. Which is a really lovely, that you know, after he's been through a heart attack, all of this, he still wants to get up and... Yeah. Though I think for me, I mean, you know, the ostensible twist is... Dietrich at the end yeah so she's so in love with him and spoilers then she sees him with another woman and she stabs him to death right mm. um, but also it made me realize this is why Theron Power accepted the role you know because I mean he's usually lovely and charming and nice and actually you know to be the callous user running off with a younger woman <laughs> I think that moment right is probably one of the moments that must have said oh you know I this will be interesting for me to do. Because the rest doesn't have much. <laughs> do you think he thought it would make him seem sexy and cool? Well, just... Because he was a real actor, right? And he was somebody who was really interested in acting. And, mm. you know, he was doing stage plays at this moment and trying to expand his range. Because he'd always been the pretty boy or the charming boy. He became a star very young. But this is like a user, yeah? And a gigolo and a failure, so it's a, it's a character that on, on paper has a lot of dimensions, right? It's yeah. just he's not given much screen time. <laughs> I was reading that um, he was unconvinced about taking the role until he was offered this and his next film for $300,000 each. Yes. But during the production of his next film, he died. Yes. Uh, and he was, what, 42, 43? Wasn't very old. He was old. young. I, uh, yeah, I can't remember. He was mid-40s, I think. Um, um, died by heart looks, attack, ironically. He looks older than Dietrich. Yeah. In this film. And he's only in his 40s, and she's in her mid-50s or, or more. Yeah, 13 but, years between them. Yeah. So um, so actually, that's something also interesting to see, how our sense of age has changed, right? Because, you know, in I think in 1957, 43 would have been considered middle age, right? It was, mm. you know, kind of now, it's, it's, it's seen as relatively young, really. But he really looks, you know... Uh, much older than you expect a 43-year-old to look now. Yeah, he's got some miles on the clock. Yeah, man, he's been to war and so on, right? Like, you know, so... Smoked heavily. Yes. Drank heavily. Well... Those heart attacks don't come but from look nowhere. look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I look younger than Tron Power. Let's <laughs> not go crazy. <laughs> you haven't got his makeup eyes. <laughs> so, it's a star studded film right? and it's a film that respects its audience's intelligence you know it has the confidence even though it moves a lot of the plot outside of the courtroom at the start you learn about the character and stuff still it's dialogue heavy 
plot heavy, character heavy. It, it, it takes its time to get into details and have these arguments and conversations. It's a film that really respects its audience's ability to listen and to interpret, yeah. you know, which is necessary. It's extremely engaging. Yes. It's very good at it. And you were saying one of the things that you like is that it's very Billy Wilder. Yes. Maybe you can explain why. Well, I mean, I think it's very Billy Wilder because, you know, he's got a, a view of the world that is both cynical, you know, or say pragmatic. <laughs> uh, people say, I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist. I'm a realist, that's right. <laughs> so, you know, we have like Wilder's re- realism, but also his wit and uh, his intelligence and his love of drama and flourishes and glamour. I've just bought uh, his book of journalism, you know, because he was a journalist in Berlin in the 20s. I mean, he's such an interesting man, right? You know, I think he was born in Vienna to non-practicing Jews, I think. But as soon as he could, he went on to Berlin and he was really a fan of American jazz and everything American. And he interviewed Mm. Paul Whiteman and, and he'd been a taxi dancer. Right, a guy that women pay to dance with, right? So they'd go to coffee shops and you could buy a token and pick who you wanted to dance with. And, you know, the suggestion is that he was also a male prostitute, right? Because. Uh, that sounds not far from being a jiggler for a start. Yeah. Know, like... So, I mean, the Tron Power character has all of those mm. shades, yeah, that kind of feed into a little bit Billy Wilder's history, right? He's clearly a gigolo, he's somebody who charms women, who is aware of the lower depths <laughs> of life, but also attentive to the surface and glamour of what an appreciation of a hat can do <laughs> and get you. Yeah? yeah. So I liked it very much, and we saw it twice, in fact. Yeah, we did, because the first time I was in a bit of a mood, so I didn't pay attention to the first half, and then the second time <laughs> you had a bit of a nap just now. So <laughs> together we have watched it. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, and, and my... Uh, you know, drooping off a little bit was no reflection on the film. So, you know, no, you've had a busy day. old day in London. That's right. Yeah. So, so I would highly recommend it. And actually, I, I am going to think some more about the way that it was shot, which I think is brilliant. Okay. All right. So, thank you very much for listening. We're used to dropping at the movies, and we are on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. On social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter. And the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>